Hi, me first at Bedwater Science Center, Bemidji, Minnesota, it's October 1st, and I'm going to read you a book today. If you're one of those that are our most faithful followers, you tune in every single day at 3.30, or you tune into our shows after the fact because we put these out on YouTube and we put them out on Facebook and Twitch TV, so you watch us afterwards because they get archived immediately, you're going, wait a minute, you're going to read us a book today? It is Friday. You never read on Friday. You always read on Wednesday. That's true. All of that is true. And I just wanted to read a book to you today. So for those of you that love Wednesdays and go, oh, goody, he's going to read a book, you're getting a double dose this week. There's another reason. That's because I'm doing a follow-up to a show that Ryan did a few weeks ago where he held up this pelt. This is a coyote pelt. And he was talking about animals that hang out in groups. In this case, he said... Timber wolves, because timber wolves, they hang out in packs. And that was absolutely correct. So I'm going to put the coyote back over here. And we now switch to talking about wolves, because we have wolves right at the very center of our science center. Science center. They are both in huge, big, large aquariums. One is located just off to my left, your right. It guards the one entrance side of the entrance. And here's the other one, it's located right on the other side. This is kind of exciting because we have some people walking right through our front entrance. This is a live show. It's going to broadcast out over YouTube and on Facebook and all those things. And if you want to stop and visit, we have Peggy right at the front. That would be great. All of that happened while we were broadcasting. I don't know if that's ever happened. But we don't usually film from here, so that was kind of an exciting thing. Anyway, so we had a wolf right over there on that side of our science center. And here's another wolf. I went looking to see if I could find the name of this wolf. The history, where it came from, all those things, came up with zero. So if you know, you could give us a call or you could type in and say, oh, I know the story behind the wolf that's here at the Science Center. All I know is that it's not Lobo, which is kind of funny because Lobo is wolf for Spanish, and this is definitely a wolf. They mean it's not the Lobo that's so famous around the Bemidji area. This is not Lobo. So we have two wolves right at the entrance. Today's book is a follow-up to Wednesday's books about wolves. This was Wednesday's stories. And now I'm just going to talk about it for a bit. This is Wednesday's non. This is Wednesday's fictional story. It is a story that has Little Red Riding Hood, kind of a modern today version. Little Red Riding Hood, and the villain is a wolf. So we took a wolf and said, well, it must be a really bad animal because this wolf is the villain. And then I read you a book called The Wolves Are Back. It's a story, a non-fictional story, about the wolves in the Yellowstone. So today is a little bit like that. But before I read you a book about wolves, I want to tell you a story about wolves. And I'm going to turn this story right to Andy. So if I'm not looking right at you, it's because I'm looking over. I wonder what that would be your right shoulder. I'm looking over your shoulder and over to Andy. This is a true story, so it's non-fictional. This happened about 30 years ago. I was teaching up in War Road, Minnesota, and if, if you're not familiar with Minnesota, I used to tell people, you know that little square that pushes up into Canada? It's a little tiny square, it's right at the top of Minnesota, and it just pushes up into Canada. That's where War Road is, it's in that little tiny square. So I was right there at the very top of the state, and a friend called me up, this was probably in February, that's what I remember, it was February. He called me up and he said, you want to go howling tonight? Okay, I had to think about that a little bit. What do you mean howling? And he goes, well, if you're ever going to get a response from a terminal wolf, it's best to do it right in the coldest nights of the winter. Go out there in January or February, and if you start howling, maybe you'll get a howl back. I said, okay, I'm in. So he came over to my house. Maybe it was about 10 o'clock. The very first thing we had to do was practice. So we practiced howling. We howled together until we thought, hmm, that sounds pretty good. And we drove way out into the woods south of Warro, waited and waited and waited. I don't know, maybe it was midnight or one o'clock in the morning when we first started howling. Does that sound crazy? Uh, well, I think it sounds crazy. But I happen to think there's nothing wrong with crazy. So here we are up in the middle of the woods howling, and wouldn't you know, first one pack, there was more than one wolf responding back from our howling. And then, whether they were responding to us or 
Maybe it was another pack we're spending back to the first one. Now they were hauling from two different directions, which was very fun. That's what he did. True story. What am I reading today? I'm going to read two of these three books. I'm just going to tell you about this one. This one's called Little Wise Wolf. And as soon as I get done reading, I'm going to take Little Wise Wolf and all five of these books back to the Bemidji Library. I'm going to do it right after we get done broadcasting. So if you said, I want to be the one that gets that book, it'll be there by about 4.15 today. What I like about this book is that it's completely fictional. It's completely made up. It's not a true story. In this case, the wolf is the hero. They don't make the wolf out to be a villain. They make the wolf out to be a hero. Okay, the wolf does go through this period of time where he's a little obstinate, a little braggish, thinks he's really something. And then the wolf goes through this period of time where the wolf realizes that friendship is really important and changes the way. But he's never this villain. He's always this cool... Uh, cool story. He's always this character in a story that has nothing to do with being a film and doing all kinds of stuff. So you might want to read that one. These two are ones that are from our Bemidji Library, and they're non-fictional. What I mean when I say non-fiction is that everything in here was written by somebody who went and studied to make sure that what they were about to write was true. You can often tell a non-fiction book because, well, that picture looks real. And they might start with that. The next thing you can do when you're reading a non-fiction book and you want to pick one out is see if there's a table of contents. Yes, a fictional book can have a table of contents. But non-fiction books almost always have a table of contents. So this is a non-fictional book and it has a table of contents. But often non-fictional books you can tell them in another way, because at the very back of the book, they'll have a glossary, and this one has a glossary of terms, and all that sort of stuff. That's not why I'm going to read you this book. That might even be a little boring. I'm just telling you how non-fiction books work. I'm going to switch to this side, because it's just a little easier for me to read. And meet the gray wolf. The other thing that's wonderful about a non-fiction book, this is the way I read non-fiction books, you can just jump around anywhere you want in the book, there's no storyline, so you don't have to say, oh, I can't skip a page, can I? And so, Meet the Gray Wolf is actually this introduction page. And instead of reading everything from this page, I'm just going to read where it below what's in the picture. Gray Wolf, stay alert in case the prey is nearby. All mammals share certain features. They are vertebrates, animals with backgrounds that have fur or hair. All mammals are warm-blooded, and all mammal mothers make milk to feed their babies. Most mammals give birth to live young, although a few mammals lay eggs. That's interesting. I'm going to have to think about that a little bit, because that's what it says. A few mammals lay eggs. Gray wolves share these traits with other mammals, but they have traits that set them apart. Okay, next page. I'm going to read this one. Did you know a large male gray wolf can eat 20 pounds, about 9 kilometers, I'm sorry, kilograms, of meat, fat, and bone in a single meal? Think about the size of that steak. I'll think I have that quarter pounder, that would be a fourth of a pound of meat. 20 pounds in one meal is what they're capable of eating. Now, despite the gray wolf's name, its fur, fur can range in many, many colors. If you're getting a little confused by gray wolf, gray wolf, gray wolf, timber wolf, gray wolf, it's the same species, same animal, just two different areas. So when I say gray wolf, you can insert timber wolf if you want. In a moment, I don't. Gray wolves versus coyotes. Coyote scans the desert for prey. Like gray wolves, coyotes eat other animals. Eat other animals that will make you a wolf. That's a carnivore, exactly. So they're carnivore. Although in one of the books it talks about how every once in a while gray wolves like to eat fruit. Which maybe they're just trying out something different for their meal, or maybe they're just really hungry. A coyote has a narrow snout and pointer ears more pointy 
then a gradient. So there's a pi off, and there's a gradient. This is one of the things I like about this book, because all of a sudden it says, so let's compare a wolf to a, uh, and then they pick some really unusual things. How about a wolf to a manatee? So here's sizes. A gray wolf can be anywhere from five to six and a half feet long. A manatee can be anywhere from eight to 13 feet long. How much can a gray wolf weigh? 80 to 175 pounds. And I will tell you, there are books that try to make a wolf so scary you think they were five times the size of a human being. This makes almost all wolves small, smaller than me. 440 to 1300 pounds for a man. Where do gray wolves live? This is kind of cool because we'll go right into the map and go, well, it makes sense that there are gray wolves right there in the middle of Minnesota. There's the United States, all of Canada, uh, much of the northern part of the United States would be a place where you'll see a gray wolf, and then Asia. What do gray wolves like to eat? They like to eat very, very large uh, herbivores. So a gray wolf and a caribou, that would make a perfectly good sense for a gray wolf. Red foxes are more likely than gray wolves to live near people. I'm going to do a comparison, and this one is going to red foxes. Did you know that red foxes have sensitive ears? From above ground, they can hear a rodent in the ground. This red fox has found a role to eat. Because red foxes eat many kinds of food, they can survive in many places. So, yes, a red fox would be one of those animals that might go in your garden. Of course, I don't know, maybe it won't be too. But red fox, they're more likely to be around your house. All right, now let's compare. Not the manatee this time. How about a panda? So where do gray wolves live? They live in the tundras, the forests, the grasslands, and the desert. Well, pandas live in one place, bamboo forest. That's it. Uh, they also live in North America, Europe, or Asia. Uh, pandas live in central China. What do gray wolves eat? They eat moose, elk, bison, uh, musk, oxen, reindeer, beavers, rabbits, livestock, pandas, they eat bamboo. That's it. The life of a gray wolf is in a pack. Did you know, in the fairy tale, such as Little Red Riding Hood, gray wolves act like villains. In reality, gray wolves are weary, wary of people and almost never attack them. So if you wanted to do your own case study, if you wanted to say, wait a minute, I want to know, this would be a very good search for you. You could go to a, whatever your search engine is, go ahead and find the number of recorded wolf attacks on human beings. They're saying, almost never. It's kind of a fun page because it talks about how gray wolves communicate with one another, including the fact that they spend time smelling each other to see what each other have been doing. Oh, here come another comparison. This one's wolves and lions. So wolves, when they're in a group, that's called a pack. Lions, when they're in a group, that's called a, be a pride. Very good. A pack will have anywhere from two to 40. Pride will have anywhere from 2 to 36. What's the typical size? Uh, a typical size for a pack is 5 to 8. A typical size for a pride is 15. This one's kind of cool. What is their range? Their range they live, and they live anywhere from 7 to 5,000 miles. Where are uh, Lions is much smaller. 8 miles to 1,440 miles. Well, let's compare gray wolves versus wolf. Uh, moose. Moose often live all by themselves, so they're very solitary animals. Two male moose might block antlers. Did you know a wolf pup at birth weighs about 17 ounces? You went, wow, how much is 17 ounces? You'd go to the store and you'd buy yourself a pint, Coca-Cola, or whatever your soda was going to be, a pint of it, and that's about the weight of a newborn pup. 
or about the size of a squirrel. Adult gray wolves teach their young how to hunt. Next comparison. This is to a dwarf mongoose. Well, that's kind of interesting. We're picking things that are pretty obscure now, at least in my book. So, gray wolf, dwarf mongoose, about uh, six to seven pups. We also call mongoose pups. They have four pups. Uh, age when the young are ready to hunt on their own. For a wolf, it's somewhere around 10 months. For a mongoose, it's six months. Age when we would call them adults. What's the maturity age? Two to three years. Same thing with the mongoose. Around three years. And then what is the life expectancy? Five to six years would be the life expectancy of a wolf. For a mongoose, it's around 10 years. Oh, how about another comparison? Gray wolves versus snowshoe hares. Snowshoe hare has this defense mechanism that's a pretty interesting one. I want to pause there because you might be looking going, Oh, are you talking about rabbits? No, I'm not talking about rabbits. I'm talking about hares. They are two different things. So what a hare does is it has this defense mechanism where it can change the color of its hair based upon the place that it's living. Here, this could even be the exact same animal. Here he is living inside the log. Here he is living all out there in the snow. He's changed his color. Called camouflage. Next page. These are kind of fun. I'm not going to read it. What's good about getting two books about the exact same area? I think it's worth the fact that the next time you could just skim right through it. See if there's anything in that book that's different than this book. See if there's anything in that book that, that adds, you know, that this one adds to that book. So it's just kind of a fun way to look at it. And again, I wouldn't read everything in this book. I'd go looking for the things that really pique my interest. Like this one. Timber wolves of the same family may have coats that are completely different. Could that be that you'll have two youngins from the exact same batch and they don't look like each other? Come on into the science center. Go and look at our two guinea pigs. They're out of the exact same bat. They not only have different to, colors, my puppet's in the wash. They have different hairstyles cool in their exact out of the exact cool same bat. So I'm gonna bring in for you guys. Still have a happy time. Wolves move about everywhere. Yeah. 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 Y
sense of hearing is so good that it could hear a mouse moving underneath thick layers of snow. Sounds a little bit about what we said about kayaks, doesn't it? Pack members hunting together are much more successful than wolves that hunt all by themselves. Wolves sometimes need good balance just to get across the river. Fun fact that the wild wolves live to be as old as 10 years. That book talked about it too, didn't it? I remember it saying something about six to seven years. So, should a person read more than one book? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Go out there and see. The best place for a wolf to live, hunt, or raise their pups is in a large territory without any human beings. Large open territory. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of these around the world. Are there wolves around the region? Yeah, I, I think there is a pack that's in Minnesota, and I agree, I think it's a little ways north of here. I think it would not be unusual for somebody from Minnesota to say, Yeah, I've heard wolves, I've seen wolves, I grant. I don't think it's coming to the door. We should read from there every day, maybe. It's a little more exciting. Anyway, yeah, it's a little more exciting. Curious young pups are not allowed to stray too far from their den. When pups are hungry, they lick the mouth of the adult and let them know this is time to eat. Okay, there you go. That's how wolves communicate. Here's a fun fact for you. Pups from the same litter can have coats that are a different color. Ooh, maybe in the last book, so yeah. Even young pups learn how to howl. There he is, learning how to howl. The howl of a wolf can travel great distances, letting others who hear it know that their territory has been claimed. Huh. You can see those things, right? Wolves growl and show their teeth when challenged by other wolves to keep lower pack members in their place. This is growl being done to another wolf. Just to say, stay in your place. This might be the alpha. This is an interesting one. Any idea how many teeth there are in a wolf? You think it's more than human beings? How many do humans have? Uh, let's see. How about, I'm just going to guess, 36? I think a wolf probably has more than us. Yeah, they have 42. Of which one is called the canine. And it can be as big as an inch long. So there's the canine. Uh, for all you listeners out there, when you get all done, yeah, you wear your mask. Go to a mirror, pull down your mask, and see if you have any canine teeth. We've got two little ones. That's right. You will find that you have a canine tooth too. It's not quite as effective as that one, but it's definitely there. This wolf will be howling to let them let the pack know how far it is and what is the best direction to travel. This is his way of communicating. Maybe he found some really good food. Wolf tracks usually appear in a straight line because wolves put one foot right in front of the other as they walk away. These wolf pups are leaving the den for the first time, eager to explore their world. The biggest wolf on record weighed 225 pounds. Uh, there we have the internet sites you can go look up, you can study the index, all of that sort of stuff. This one's wolf. I will do exactly as I promised. I will say goodbye to you. I'm going to pack up my books, head over to the Brigham Day Library, and return. Just so you know, today happens to be Friday, October 1st. We are open six days a week. That's Monday through Saturday, 9 30 to 5 o'clock, and on Sundays, are open 1 to 5. Say for all of you Bemidji listeners out there, I just want to remind you that we're open on Monday. So if it just so happens that you don't go to school next Monday, maybe you should come 